There are two testaments or divisions in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is before Jesus. The New Testament starts with Jesus. There are 66 books, 929 chapters, 31,102 verses, 783,137 words in the Bible. That's a lot of work to read and remember. But what if I told you that you could learn everything you need to make it to heaven in just 19 words? If the key to knowing God and making it to heaven was just 19 words, would you want to know it and learn it and memorize it and follow it? We have a tendency to make things really complicated, sometimes overwhelming. But in the verse we look at today, Jesus summed up the whole thing in just 19 words. Ready for him? I'll get there in a minute. Because <laughs> I want to set it up first because the context makes it even more powerful. We're looking at the last 24 hours of Jesus' life, the most important 24 hours in our faith. It all started with an event we call the Last Supper on Jesus' final night with his disciples before his arrest and crucifixion. It was an emotionally charged, action-packed, tension-filled meal. If you weren't here last week, go back and listen online. It's Jesus humbled himself, and he washed the feet of his disciples in a beautiful demonstration of the importance of serving others. When you selflessly serve, you follow the example of Jesus. Never get so impressed with yourself that you're too important to serve. After washing their feet, Jesus served the disciples what we call communion. And now I want to switch over to Matthew 26 and pick up the story. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. The setting was not what artists depict and we imagine. It was not a banquet. It was a warm, intimate gathering of close friends. They sat on pillows and reclined around a table close to each other, sharing conversation and food. On this occasion, while they were eating, Jesus dropped a bomb. Eleven of the disciples had no clue what was coming, but Jesus knew what was going to happen. He said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. One of you is going to hand me over to the people who want to kill me. They were very sad. And one after the other, they begin to say, surely not I, Lord. Picture the disciples sitting around the table right after Jesus told them one of them was a traitor. They couldn't believe it. One at a time, they asked, not me, Jesus. I wouldn't do that to you. It's, it's not me, is it? Not now. Not ever. And Jesus replied, the one who's dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. In other words, guys, it is absolutely one of you. The son of man, that's one of the titles Jesus used to refer to himself, will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he'd not been born. And I think all the disciples probably agreed, you better believe it'd be better if he hadn't been born. And we might make sure that happens right now. They were angry at the thought one of them would betray Jesus, and not only betray Jesus, but in betraying Jesus would also betray all the rest of them. And then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, surely not I, Rabbi. Now, I don't, I don't know why Judas asked the question. After all his time with Jesus, we assume Judas knew he couldn't fool Jesus. But he asked the question anyway, and Jesus looked at him and said, yeah, it's you. Judas stood up and left the dinner on his way to betray Jesus, and the rest of the disciples were rocked. The room was filled with emotion, anger, shock, hurt, outrage. The disciples didn't know what to say or to do. Over the course of three years, the disciples had become as close as brothers. Jesus taught them, prepared them to lead the disciples saw Jesus healed. They saw dead people come back to life and blind eyes opened and deaf ears hearing. 
They heard revolutionary teaching. This group had no doubt Jesus was not a man. He was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. After all they'd been through, how could one of them betray Jesus? Their time together was coming to an end. Difficult times and deep sadness were just ahead. Can you imagine the emotion? The sting of being betrayed by a close friend and the agony of realizing that he'd been plotting against Jesus without them knowing it. One season was closing. Another new, difficult, trying season was beginning. The disciples would face stress, pressure, persecution, and hardship. Now remember the setting. Judas just revealed he was the betrayer. And what you expect Jesus to say is, I want to teach you something. Let me tell you what happens to sorry dogs like Judas. I want you to know, I want the church to know for generations, the traitors will burn in hell. And before they get there, they'll be miserable on earth. I will make an example of Judas and anyone else who ever decides to betray me or my church. But that's not what Jesus said. Instead, Jesus spoke directly to their fear and anxiety in one of the most amazing passages of teaching in the entire Bible. If you're in a place of uncertainty and fear, if you're not sure what's coming next, you will find strength, peace, comfort, and hope in Jesus' words. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so you may be where I am. Jesus said, guys, it's going to be okay. I'm going before you. I'm getting things ready. I know it looks like there's no answer. I know it looks like there's no hope. But you have the greatest hope of all, heaven. I'm going to get it ready, and one day soon, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to get you, and you're going to be there with me forever. That's the promise of heaven. The reason why God sent his one and only son was to save you from an eternity in hell and provide you with a way to spend eternity with him in heaven. So our approach is different than people who don't know Jesus. They don't have hope after this life. So th their complete focus is, how do I survive this situation? How do I get out of this? How do I escape? What can I do to make this life better now? But because you have Jesus, you have hope beyond this life. You have hope eternal. You have a promise from heaven. One day soon, he's coming back and you get to be in heaven with him forever. That's something to feel pretty good about. I got about eight amens. But if you really knew what was waiting for you there, you would have been on your feet shouting and clapping, excited that heaven's coming. Why, why didn't you? Because I'm afraid we've gotten a little too comfortable on earth. I've actually had people tell me, Pastor, I don't want Jesus to come too soon. I've got so much I still want to do. Really? That vacation is going to be better in heaven? Disney, Disney's going to be better than heaven. You really think so? Getting married, that's going to be better than heaven. Don't say anything. <laughs> Getting your driver's license. I had somebody say, I, I, don't, I don't want Jesus to come back until I, until I get to drive. <laughs> okay. It's not going to be that good, and you're not going to be good at it. Although we don't talk about it enough and sure don't get excited as we should, heaven is still our hope. We can endure pressure, hardship, persecution, stress, and still be hope-filled because our hope is not this world. Our hope is the next world, heaven. Even if living for Jesus offered nothing on this earth, no peace, purpose, or strength for this life, it would all be worth it for the next life. Jesus has gone before us to prepare a place. Jesus said to the disciples, rest easy, guys. I'm going ahead. I'll see you there. 
Then Jesus said, you know the way to the place where I'm going. What was Jesus talking about? Where was he going? How would they get there? Was it a puzzle? Was there a map? You can imagine the puzzled look on the disciples' faces. And then finally, Thomas voiced the question that everyone else wanted to ask. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? If we don't know where you're going, how do we know how to get there? That's a question people still ask. How do we get to heaven? How do we know the way? Virtually every religion seeks to answer that. One thing almost all false religions have in common, they offer a way to heaven. That's so interesting to me. They don't invent a new place. So even in, the, in the inventing the way, they're validating what Jesus said, that there's a place. They don't deny heaven exists. They take the goal announced by Jesus, and then they tr try to design a new way to get there. Some teach it's by doing good things. If you do enough good, you make it. The problem is no one knows who sets the standard. How much is good is good enough? And what if, what if you miss it by one good deed? How do you know? Some teach you don't have to do anything, that everyone goes. It's just a free ticket. When you're done with life on this earth, you start your next life in heaven. Radical extremists think if you kill your enemies, you'll gain entrance to heaven or paradise. One religion believes that only 144,000 will make it, which is challenging because they have more followers than that. So they don't really say who the 144,000 will be, but you better be really good so you can somehow earn your way into the elite group that's allowed to make it to heaven. When it comes time for a funeral, everyone wants to put their loved one in heaven because without heaven, there isn't hope. It's just over. Even if they totally lived without God, at their funeral, they start singing songs about heaven. They talk about how nice the person was, how kind they were, how much they loved people, all in an attempt to convince themselves their family member went to heaven. They don't want to think about the alternative, so they create any path than they, they can think of. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? That's the big question. In response, Jesus summed up the gospel in one sentence that no doubt the disciples never forgot. This became the center of the teaching of the church. Jesus answered. Now here's the 19 words. I told you we'd get there. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We must present Jesus to a lost and dying world. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the answer. What do we need to be telling people about Jesus? We need to tell them the same thing Jesus said about himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the way. I'm famous for getting lost. Even with good directions, I am capable of being totally and completely lost. I can't read a map. Now, for those of you who are under the age of 25, we used to have things called maps. This one's, this one's plastic, not paper, and it unfolds easy, which means it's not a true map. But, <laughs> right, see, the, and if you're over 25, you're laughing because you had big old things of paper that you unfolded, and then you could not fold that thing back. And then you had to look at all these little things and you had to plot your, you had to plot your course on your own. You just had to look and kind of go, well, let's see if I want to go to McCrory. I need to go. You had to figure out the roads on your own on the map. It'll be up here. You can come look at it after service if you want to see what it looks like. Very cool history kind of piece. I struggle to follow the directions of my GPS. If I get distracted, I can even get lost driving home from church. No lie, it happened to me a few months ago on a Saturday night. I was listening to a really good book and I was just driving. 
I, I wasn't paying any attention to where I was going. I'm just driving, listening to the book. And when I finally looked up, I had no idea where I was. I still don't know where it was. It's somewhere I've never been before. And so I stopped. I didn't want to call Parker or Cindy because I knew the ridicule that would be heaped on me if I said I'm lost. And it'd be like early onset dementia. Here we go. Um, so I wasn't going to do that. So I stopped. I opened my Maps app. I chose home. And I followed it to get back. I'm not exaggerating. When it comes to directions, I am hopeless and clueless. But if you say, Pastor Rod, follow me, I want to take you to the best restaurant in town. I'm going to take you for good Cajun food since you just haven't had it for a long time. No directions necessary. I'll go right in front of you. You just follow. No problem. I can follow you all the way to a big bowl of gumbo. See, I may not be able to find my way on my own, but I'm a good follower. John chapter 8, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the way. When you follow Jesus, you won't make wrong turns, U-turns, or end up on a dead-end street. Instead, you'll be blessed on course headed to heaven. You'll be able to overcome the obstacles of life and navigate your way through the twists and turns if you keep your eyes on Jesus and follow. The song we just sang is actually really good theology. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Look full in his glorious face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. How do you follow? Read and obey his teaching. Don't pick and choose. Decide which applies to you, which doesn't. Obey it all. Jesus said, if any of you wants to serve me, then follow me. Then you'll be where I am, which makes sense. Ready to serve at a moment's notice. The Father will honor and reward anyone who serves. Another version says, follows me. People show up at church the first time lost and looking for direction. They may look like they've got it together, but most of the time, that's not the case. Their marriage is in trouble. Their kids are a mess. Their finances are a wreck. They're fighting addiction. They feel hopeless. They say, we've lost our way. We thought we knew where we were going, but somehow we got off track. We need help. Right then, people need to hear about Jesus. They need to be told Jesus has the answers they're looking for. They need to be told Jesus battled the same temptations and overcame them. They need to be told Jesus will bear their burdens, forgive their sins, and lead them in a new way of life. He's the way. Now, listen, it's important to remember, our church can help people along the way, but we aren't the way. Our church can't save you. No church can save you. Jesus is the way. Our mission is to point people to Jesus, not us. We may be good waypointers, but we're not the way. Now, you've probably seen a sign like this for pizza or tacos or tax preparation. <laughs> the person holding it twirls it around and throws it in the air. I'm not going to try that because we all know what's going to happen. But they do a lot of, here, Timothy, come on up here and just kind of give us a little demonstration of what they do. I think <laughs> Timothy would be a good sign twirler. <laughs> kind of give us the little, uh, like, like they do. Yeah, and the, the little dance they do, you know, they kind of, they... they Pathetic. <laughs> These signs have a purpose. You don't go to the person holding the sign and say, give me a pizza. All they're doing is pointing to you towards what you really need. We need to be like the sign twirlers. We aren't the answer, but we can point the way to the answer people need. One of my friends a few weeks ago said, Pastor Rod, 
I, I just, I have to thank you because you saved my life. Well, I was honored. I was quick to tell him I didn't save your life. I can't. But it was a joy to point you to Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If your response is, well, I think every religion leads to God, this verse is a problem for you because Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you accept Jesus as the Son of God, this is non-negotiable. There's no other way. There's not another alternative. If you decide all roads lead to heaven, then you're rejecting Jesus and his teaching and you're deciding he really wasn't the son of God because if he was the son of God, he was right. Why do people, even good people, want to believe all roads lead to heaven? Because they can't bear the thought of someone they love not making it. So they rationalize that everyone will. It's just not true. We should passionately point people to the way, Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To which you say, well, isn't that, isn't that too narrow, too restrictive? It's not restrictive at all. Remember what Jesus said in perhaps the most known Bible verse of all, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Titus chapter two, verse 11 says, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The message of Jesus is the most inclusive message of all time. Anyone and everyone is invited. Eternal life can be had by anyone everywhere. No one is excluded. All you have to do is believe in Jesus and commit your life to him. Doesn't matter how big of a, a jerk you've been in the past. It doesn't matter the mistakes and the failures. Even the worst person you know is included in whoever. Jesus is the way. What about people born into other religions and cultures? Jesus had a plan for that too. That's where you come in. He told us, go make disciples of all nations. That's why we partner with and send missionaries around the world. People need to know in every culture, every tribe, every language, and every tongue that Jesus is the way. Second, people need to know Jesus is the truth. I wish I could say you'll never be lied to at church. That's not true. In fact, lying is so common among religious people, we have a word for it, hypocrite. Lies told in church are especially painful. You can handle it when a mechanic tries to sell you work you don't need. You don't expect politicians to keep their promises. But when a pastor or a TV preacher preaches against sexual sin, even while involved in his own, it's devastating to people's faith. People have become spectacle of church because of highly publicized preacher failures. The list is long. The lies were convincing. Some of you walked away from church because of it. Men and women disappointed you and let you down, but you can rely on Jesus. He is and will always be the truth. In a world full of lies, everyone's searching for the truth. Don't make the mistake of believing we're the truth. If you do, you'll end up disappointed because we're humors, humans. We can't live up to that, we'll fail. Only Jesus can live up that expectation. He and he alone is the way. He is the way. He is the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the life. Maybe you've heard the saying, life begins at 40. I've been there, and I can tell you, that's a lie. There is nothing, I have yet to find, maybe there's something, there's nothing wonderful about getting old, except for the fact that you're closer to heaven. That's the only thing I can think of is every day, I'm one day closer to no longer being here. Other than that, other than that, getting old is not a good deal. Students think life begins when you get your driver's license or when you're allowed to date. Some people think life begins when you get out of school and you start making money. <laughs> you 
You called that one, didn't you? <laughs> or when your parents can't tell you what to do. Life begins when you finally start your career. Some people think life begins when you get married. More laughter on that one. Or life begins when you have kids. Some people think life begins when the kids are finally out of the house. Or when you have grandkids. Or when you can you get out of debt. Or when you can afford the boat or the vacation or the clothes you wanted. When you build your dream house. Some people think life begins when you retire. None of that is when life begins. Life begins when you realize that Jesus is the way and the truth. Amen. I want to show you one more thing. There's significance to the order of the words. Way, truth, and life. Jesus listed life last because you don't get it until you start following the, his way in believing the truth. Every day, you see people who have no life no, they exist. They have bills, a job, kids, schedules, problems, stress, but no life, no energy, no passion. They may, might put on a good show on social media without, without Jesus. They will never really have life. Week after week, people who are burned out, stressed out, and worn out come staggering into church the last thing they need to be told is yet another thing to add to their busy schedule. Instead, they need to be introduced to Jesus. Here's my challenge to you. Be a sign twirler. Point other people to Jesus and, and share his love with all lost and hurting world around you. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And he alone is the life you've been looking for. If you're searching for truth, answers, and direction, I've got it for you. 19 words. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to pray for you. And I feel especially led to pray for people who you've been disillusioned by people. And as a result, you're kind of cautious, about church, about getting involved, about trusting. <laughs> you may be watching online because you're afraid that if you show up in person, you'll just get hurt again. I want to pray for you. And I want you to understand, we're not the way. We're not the truth. He is the way. He is the truth that leads to life. I understand that church hurts are deep hurts. I get that that disappointment, disillusionment can run really deep. Maybe you were just, you were really passionate about Jesus and you were really in love with him and then a leader let you down and now you haven't got that spark back. Or maybe you were really close to Jesus and you were on track and then people you thought loved you instead lied to you and you're struggling. I want to pray for you. I just feel led to do that. This is not my plan at all. But I want to pray for you. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I will pray for you. I, I'm not going to ask you to stand or anything like that. No tricks. I just want to pray for you. Yeah, quite a few. If you're watching online, our, our pastors will pray for you. If you click the button for prayer, just enter in chat. Lord, I pray for people in this room and people watching online who because of people have lost the way. Because they were disappointed, disillusioned, deceived. They've, they've held back from everything you have for them, everything you want for them. Held back from relationship, from engagement. 
Lord, I pray you would help them with just these 19 words to recognize that no person is the way and the truth. You are the way and the truth. And together, we just want to point people to you. And that if any person claims to be the way and the truth, we know they're not it. But real life comes from following you. So I pray you would heal some hurts and mend some broken hearts. Lord, I pray for people who've stood off at a distance for way too long, that they would put their faith and trust, not in people, but in you, and together we would point others to you. And then Lord, I pray for people who right now they're just kind of existing because they haven't followed the way and discovered the truth. Thank you, Jesus, that you make a way for all of us, that no one is exempt, no one is excluded, every soul matters to you, that regardless of our past, regardless of our failures, regardless of how many times we've failed, we, we can follow you and you will lead us. Thank you that you are the way. Thank you that you are the truth. When so much around us is uncertain, thank you that you are certain and true. And thank you for the life that comes from following you, real life, abundant and free. And we pray that today in Jesus' name, amen. All right, now Timothy did a horrible job of it. But this week, I wanna see one of you on JFK with a sign like this, wearing a Statue of Liberty outfit, dancing like a fool. God bless you, I love you, have a great week.